Okay, I'd like to call the Budget Review Committee to order. It's October 28th, 2019, and we're in the Aldermatic Chamber. Would the clerk please call the roll? Alderman Lodge, Larry Wilshire. Here. Alderman Lodge, Michael O'Brien is present. Alderman at Lodge, Ben Clemens. Here. Alderman Jan Schmidt. Here. Alderman at Lodge, David Tenza. Present. Alderman at Lodge, Shoshana Kelly is absent. And our chairman, Richard Dowd. Present. Also attendance is Kim Kleiner. I'm also here. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Excuse me, Alderman Jetty. How can we forget? There you go. <laughs> it's your bill we're talking about. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go out on a limb and say there's no public comment since there's no members of the public here. Okay. Communications? There is none. Unfinished business? There is none. New business resolutions? None. New business ordinances? Before us this evening is 019063 amending the elderly and disabled tax exemptions. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to recommend final passage. Okay, the motion on the floor is to recommend final passage of 019063. Would I go out on a limb and say, Ms. Kleiner, are you here to talk about this at all, or no? Only your <laughs> Probably questions. All right, so discussion. Question, Ald uh, uh, Alderman O'Brien. Um, I seem to remember a very short time ago, and maybe other members of the board can help me out, but we looked at this issue in the past, and at that particular time, we came out and we found <clears throat> Nashua compared to other municipalities within our geographical area, uh, we're actually either quite liberal or ahead of the, the game to some degree on what we give an elderly exemption. So the question is, because whenever we give exemptions, we still have to collect a certain amount. So somebody, it's not just giving money away, somebody has to make up for the loss, and it could inflate the tax rate. So I want to understand what is the particular dire need to this at this particular time. Alderman Jetty. So the, uh, it was brought to my attention by a constituent that the, uh, that the exemption for the uh, elderly uh, was different than the exemption for the disabled. There was an inconsistency between the two. Uh, the uh, starting exemption, and uh, for those, I, I know you all know, but uh, for the public, uh, a tax exemption is, uh, it exempts part of the, the value of your property from being taxed. So the beginning tax exemption for the elderly for people 65 to 74 is 192000 So that means if you own a house that's worth 200000 the first 192000 is 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 not taxed. You're only taxed on the, on the 8000 after that. That's if you qualify. For the, uh, for the exemption. Um, this constituent pointed out that, that the, uh, the, although the, the lowest uh, or the lowest level of exemption for elderly is 192, for the disabled it starts at 194,000. It's a $2,000 difference. And um, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't really uh, determine that there was a good reason for that $2,000 and it caused some uh, confusion among uh, uh, taxpayers as to you know what, what, what exactly what they qualified for. And I, I talked to somebody in the assessing department, and they they agreed that there was some confusion by people. And so I thought for the 2000, it didn't seem like that great an impact. Uh, that it's made sense to me that we should make them the same. Uh, so what this ordinance does is it raises the elder, that, that beginning elderly exemption from 192 to 194000 It's only $2,000. Uh, I also noticed that the, uh, the, to qualify for this uh, exemption, you, uh, 
you have to, uh, you're allowed a maximum uh, income. And for the elderly, the, the income is $50,000, whether you're single or a couple. And, but for the, el for the disabled, it's 36,000 if you're single and uh, 40,000 if you're a married couple. Um, so I thought to achieve some consistency, uh, we ought to raise the, uh, the maximum income for the disabled to the same as the elderly, 50,000 for a single person or a couple, just to make them the same so that there wouldn't be uh, this, this confusion. Uh, I also noticed that the maximum assets that you're allowed for the elderly, it's 150,000. For the disabled, it's 125,000. So again, to make it consistent, uh, I thought we could you know, raise the maximum asset level to 150,000 for the disabled. So they're all the same. So, uh, so in the future, if this is adopted, the, uh, the exemption, the beginning exemption for the elderly would be 194 as it is for the disabled. And the maximum income for the elderly would be 50,000, the same thing for the disabled. The maximum assets would be 100, it's 150 now for the elderly. We would raise it to 150 for the disabled. Um, when I was reviewing the ordinance, I also noticed that the ordinance so th this, like many of our ordinances, is based upon enabling legislation uh, from the state legislature. And, you know, and that enabling legislation has qualifications uh, you know, to, to as far as uh, you know, people who, who are eligible for this. You have to own uh, your home. Um, and it talks about uh, w uh, whether you own it jointly or as a tenant in common with a spouse, or whether you own it uh, jointly or as a tenant in common with another person who is not your spouse. Um, and our ordinance uh, you know, takes these uh, qualifications and tries to condense them into one sentence, and it paraphrases these qualifications. And it, and it ends up misstating uh, the qualifications. So it, it leaves out tenants in common, um, you know, and there are some other discrepancies. So after talking to the legal department um, here, uh, uh, I, I uh, you know, they, we, we, we decided that it would be better if our ordinance um, exactly matched what the state enabling legislation was. So the, so that's that's what this this does. Instead of paraphrasing it, it copies exactly what the state law provides, and um, so uh, and I consulted with uh, the mayor's office, and he um, said that he had no problem with this. And I spoke to uh, Kim Kleiner, and uh, she did some research about what the Im the financial impact, the, the issue that you raised, Alderman O'Brien, and she uh, she came up with some uh, figures as to what the impact would be. So, if follow up. with your uh, permission, Kleiner, we can... would you like to join us? Uh, uh, can I have follow a... up? Follow up with this. I'll let Miss Kleiner have a seat. Thank you. Uh, but the last time we discussed this, particularly in the situation where. Uh, married couples. The reason we went to the 50,000 50, as compared to other communities, they had it in a way different. And when the loss of a couple, then there's like a pop-up and everything else. And we stayed at the 50 for a married couple. So regardless, if a couple should lose a spouse in a timely death, there wouldn't be somebody would get kicked off the elderly exemption because they filed jointly. Will this allow somebody be, to be kicked off? Because we took into account when we came up with that originally that you could file jointly 
for that particular reason. And Ms. Klein, do you know what I'm getting at and what I'm saying? And if you can embellish a little bit better with my question and explain it, but I know we had that safeguard in this, particularly for that reason, in case somebody should die in the situation. Kim Klein, our Administrative Services Director. Um, Alderman O'Brien, I completely understand your question. Um, this will not allow that. This does not change that fact. Still, the income um, is not to exceed 50,000 single joint. That part of it does not change that part of the, right. the qualification. Follow up, if I may. Because what it was, if somebody, it was the top end of the number to break to 50,000 when somebody dies, and, and that was the reason. It, you know, mm -hmm. We went high originally to intend to eliminate that, to having a pain of somebody, from what I understand in the past. So what Alderman Jetty's um, legislation does is it cleans up a lot of the language that has been in our existing ordinance. Um, that needed to be done. Um, there were people that were um, sometimes a little misled um, or had some misunderstanding. Um, I think this works very well. Um, and it lays it out quite clearly. What you're going to see, what the impact will be, is that increase of the $2,000 in the lower level of the elderly exemption, at least for the numbers that submitted application in the 2019 year, which were reported on the MS-1 that we delivered in your box, um, we had 248 properties um, that filed last spring um, that would reflect with no more of a loss in tax revenue than $10,822.72. So that's the real cost you're looking at. What makes it a little bit difficult is the change in the disabled. From what we know from applications submitted to our office this past spring, uh, there would have been no additional loss in revenue because no applicant was denied having assets at or below the $150,000 limit. So really, we don't see any change with that part of the legislation based on what we know now. Um, as you know, applications open up in January 1st of 2020. They're due April 15th. What we can say um, is that we look at these numbers very carefully. The part of the legislation that we were concerned about was the tax year that you were starting with. Um, and because this starts with tax year 2020, there um, is no issues with assessing having to issue refunds. Okay, Alderman Clemens, did you have a... Yeah, so... So this, okay, so this is actually going to probably be, a, a um, if anything, a positive to um, folks because we're increasing the amount. Is that correct? Far. Okay. And then my second question comes with all of the language changes, not so much the amounts, but the language changes. Is this what we're currently doing now? If somebody comes to apply? Yeah, yes, so they're they're laid out a lot better to, for the basic understanding of the public, but what assessing follows is all state laws. So in other words, if somebody comes in, because I noticed that like, you know, some of the stuff that's in here now, for example, the life insurance or, um, you know, co expenses, costs occurred in the course of conducting business enterprise, stuff like that is not obviously in the current legislation, but what I'm asking is, is if, is if when somebody comes to apply for an exemption, are all of, do we ask all of those questions currently? All the, yes, Director Kleiner. <laughs> so our assessing <clears throat> staff goes through a whole list of um, questions and the application quite thoroughly. We're looking at all a lot of these things and these issues. Um, as I said, we follow New Hampshire law. 
Um, so not necessarily everything that you have seen in the ordinance in the past. Um, there was more investigation by our office when we were reviewing applications. Follow up. Okay, so so what you're what you're telling me, if I understand correctly, is that this language is basically what the state law reads, and it is what the practice is now for the department um, as, as it exists. So we're not changing the process or anything. As we reviewed it, Alderman Jetty's language exists with current state law. Okay, and but is it state law, but is, it our pra is that our practice? That is our practice. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a couple questions, unless somebody else... Um, I know when when taxes go up um, or we reassess uh, that um, people, particularly elderly, um, are concerned about losing their homes, and and I think this this to a greatest degree uh, helps significantly uh, uh, for the people with the least incomes. And I have no problems with any of those exemptions. I, my only question is. If you're a disabled veteran that's over the age limit, do you qualify for all three exemptions? Um, well, so you're receiving the veterans credit. Um, I have not seen, as of yet, anyone also qualify for the disabled. The disabled is a little bit harder to qualify looking at the qualifications. Um, so most of our veterans receive the veterans credit, mm -hmm. um, but do not qualify for the disabled unless they meet the specific rules and regulations of the disabled. The other question I have is um, usually somebody that's applying for this is um, in a dire need, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, but when we're... And that's why we, and, and the real estate market is taken out of it because the home doesn't count. Mm -hmm. It's other assets. Um, uh, do we ever get in a situation where people, you know, all of a sudden the stock market's doing well and they have some amount of 401k or something and it, and all of a sudden they're a couple of dollars over the limit and they're off the hook or... I always thought that perhaps it should be flexible to some kind of metric that as it goes up, the exemption goes up, so they stay whole. But I'm not quite sure hey, how you would, what metric you'd use or how you would apply it, but I'm just curious. And the other thing is uh, business expenses, uh, business income is exempt. Is that right? Mm, I'm not sure where you're reading that. What's I think I read it somewhere, and I and oh, you have my. <laughs> I got it. Um, I could have been wrong, but I thought it was business expense was. Or so business. under uh, under two ninety five dash four a. Um, So when you when you're determining the uh, income, yep. so you don't uh, uh, you don't consider ex the expenses and cost incurred in the course of conducting a business enterprise. So it's not the income. It, uh, it, to determine the income, it would be the basically the net income. It would be your gross income less your expenses to determine your net income. So. Okay. If you if you're grossing a hundred thousand, but it's costing you seventy five thousand, your net is only twenty five thousand. Okay. Not hundred. I, I was just concerned that that was something we could track because you know some people could be not have a lot of assets but have a business that's making a lot of money, but mm -hmm. I mean not a lot of money, but making money, money to disqualify them. But it seems to uh, take that into account. So um, the only other thing that I had when I read this is I thought, I thought like most laws, there's too many words to say something that could be said a lot simpler. But I don't think we need to run it through legal again because it'll probably come back with twice as many words. <laughs> Alderman O'Brien. Uh, 
current law without the Not words. corporation <laughs> counsel, by the way. <laughs> the, the current operating procedure that we have without as many words, but uh, <laughs> if which is the you know, nexus of my question here. This is going to be the one property only owned by, if somebody, what I'm trying to say, if somebody owns a place down in Florida, then that's considered as an asset. So therefore, they would not be entitled to elderly exemptions in our community. Am I correct? It goes by your homestead, your home. So are you saying they live in Florida and Florida is their home and they're claiming homestead rights in Florida? Or... Where they Excuse me. <laughs> Here we go. Didn't have it on mute. No, what I'm saying is, well, that's considered probably follow-up to Alderman Dowd's. It goes into uh, collectibles. Some people have a summer home somewhere else. It may not be in Florida. It might be up at the lake. But they're under the $50,000 uh, uh, thing that's taken into account as far as what they're getting for Social Security or their particular pension, and they can bring that documentation in. But they own property somewhere else. So does property... I understood now current law says that you're looking at the one residence here in Nashua to get the elderly exemption. And if you own property somewhere else, that counts. Your assets do count. That's so asset. that still stays because I had trouble kind of reading the residence requirement and the words there. But we're going to follow that same particular procedure, correct? Yes. So, and so you have to also be careful of – so we – We've had instances in the past where they might claim they might have a home in Florida, and they're claiming the ex getting the exemption in Florida because they're claiming their homestead is in Florida. They would not be eligible for the exemption here in Nashua as well. So there's also that case. Um, so we always tell people, fill out if you don't know, fill out the application. Come in, sit with a member of our assessing department, our administrative staff, and they will walk you through it. Going to Alderman Dowd's question a little earlier, I have seen it where there are a, a few thousand. Um, unfortunately, there's no wiggle room for us. Hmm. And we have to take those applications to the Board of Assessors and the Board of Assessors have ultimate approval or denial. One other question. Um, I had some involvement with Manchester, and I can't remember whether I think I've been told by legal that our exemptions here in Nashua are the highest in the state, followed closely by Manchester or the other way around, but I think Nashua's higher. And I know when I was helping somebody file in Manchester, you know, it was like you were buying a corporation. You know, mm -hmm. it's not a simple process. And mm -hmm. the people that most need this have a hard time figuring all that out. Is there any way we can make it a little easier? So I have to, only, I can only speak to our administrative staff here who diligently sits with these people and explains everything. Um, we'll ask them to bring in their documents and then we'll explain the documents and how they affect the application. Um, I think during um, the time that we came to you and started talking about an improvement plan, we mentioned to you that a lot of this is done out in the hallway um, because there's not ample room within our assessing office to do so. That's one of the reasons we said it's important for us to add a space. Your sit, you know, our our area in assessing that these applications is stand up. It's a standing. You have many people that come in um, that may be handicapped, um, or it's a long time that you could be discussing this application, and they should be able to sit um, with our staff. Um, so we're currently looking at that. But I think that the staff does an excellent job in making sure that they understand every section of the application and how their income and their assets either apply um, or do not meet. 
confidence. And do we give them, if they don't have all of the <coughs> qualifying data required, do we give them an opportunity to try and get that and not get bogged down by some kind of an artificial deadline? Uh, yes, in fact, we do. So um, as late as um, just this past September, we finally had an application that went in front of the Board of Assessors. Um, the individual was making every attempt to get the information, um, but it was held up for various family reasons and things. So we do work with them and don't hold them to a, a deadline if we see that they are making progress in trying to get the information. That's good to know. Any other questions? Alderman Schmidt. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to say that I really appreciate the fact that we're leveling the numbers. It was very confusing for a couple of my constituents as well. I can also tell you that one of the first things I ever did as an alderman was to help a veteran understand how to get his exemption. He was totally lost and had no idea. And uh, when we introduced him downstairs, he had an opportunity to talk to someone. He understood, and he was able to get what he needed. So um, good department, and it works well. It's just a shame that it's in legalese instead of simple, <laughs> simple American language. Thank you. Paul Wilshire. Thank you. I, too, um, think that it's, you know, tough for some people to understand, but I think the staff we have is really good and you know we'll take their time and make sure they understand everything that they're signing or looking for um i was a little reluctant at first with this legislation but you sold me i mean i think it's a good idea i think that leveling those out makes sense um and i thank you alderman jetty for doing this you're welcome oh brian yeah i too uh like alderman uh wilshire had a couple of questions on it and the reason is because I completely understand when you as up at the state level when we came up with the uh, veterans and we had to look cold hard into Nashua and we put on like didn't granted 100 percent to what the state law allowed because there's the dangles, dangling particle out there how many veterans actually live in the community what would qualify and then the next thing that you would know we would actually be hurting our resources. I'm all in favor of helping the elderly live and come and live in the great city that this is, but I also keep in mind, anytime we look at disabled or elderly exemptions, we gotta remember the other people who are making up for that particular tax loss You know that, that occurs. We do have right now the situation uh, with the Elm Street School that needs to be either repaired or replaced and other general issues. So if I came across a little bit like the Doubting Thomas, it was with good particular reasons. And I'm glad Alderman Jetty recognizes that the good work we do up at the State House in correcting the, <laughs> the thing, it's good to be rewarded once in a while that sitting on both uh, the House of Legislators and uh, here with the city that can work together to come out something positive. So I am going to support this very well. Okay. Speaking of the state legislator, legislation, and here it says the city of Nashville hereby adopts the provisions of New Hampshire revised status, revised statutes annotated 72 colon 37 dash B as they may be amended from time to time. Um, now, will our ordinance automatically change as state law changes, or does it somehow trigger that it has to come back and be changed, or how is that going to work? We watch state law, um, so we get notified, but I think some of the very cleanup that Alderman Jenny has brought forth is, is probably a result of laws changing and, and but we should be updating our ordinances mm -hmm. with changes that are made at the state level. We're notified um, as soon as any changes. So as the head of assessing, you're going to be notified when state law changes, <laughs> and you'll bring that to the attention of the board or legal to change our local ordinance? Sure, we'd be happy to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Any other questions or concerns? All right, the motion on the floor is to recommend final passage to the full board on 
Ordinance 019-063. Seeing no more discussion, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank Director you. Kleiner. General discussion. No? Okay. I uh, will. Well, okay. I'll wait for the public comment. No public remarks by Alderman. A couple things. Um, I don't know if you get notified today that the budget meeting schedule for December 23rd is moved to the 16th. And we're also going to have another budget on December 2nd. So if you just note those dates down, you'll be, it'll be in the schedule when it comes out. But I just thought I'd give you a heads up on things that, so we can get cleaned up. Is a question of the chair? Yes. Um, if you call a meeting on my birthday, is there any dispensation oh. or any compensation with that? Yeah, you have to take us all out after Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> I will be here on my birthday, folks. <laughs> yes, Alderman Wilshire. Thank you. Um, and the reason for the budget change in December is because the full board of aldermen meeting would have been on Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve. So figuring that we probably wouldn't all want to be, well, maybe some of us would want to be here on Christmas Eve, but not me. Um, so we, we're going to move that to the 23rd, which is why Alderman Dowd graciously switched budget. Okay, and I think there's a personal meeting schedule for December 2nd. I think we're going to move that. The chair may not know it yet from that committee, but <laughs> there's a reason. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, no non-public required. Do I hear a motion? Motion to adjourn. Motion is to adjourn. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We're adjourned at 7.32 p.m. Mike's just still on. <laughs>